All right, this is part two of pressors and sedation. In the first video, we talked about pressors. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about sedation and analgesia. So again, I like to have my learners list out all the medications that they know. And usually this is gonna be propofol, dexmedetomidine, also known as Presidex, Midazolam, also known as Versed, and Ketamine. So by far, out of all of these medications, our first line one is definitely gonna be Propofol. The reason is because it's super quick on and quick off, so it's super easy to titrate and just a very easy medication to use in general. Moving down the line, I would say again, you know, Presidex is kind of going to be my number two, number three is going to be Versed, and then number four is Ketamine. The key thing that you want to ask the people you're teaching uh, in this part is what are some of the main side effects of each of these different medications, and that will help them know when we should switch from one sedative to another. So for Propofol, what is the number one most common side effect? That's going to be hypotension. And then for dexmedetomidine or Presidex, that's going to be bradycardia. For Versed, it's going to be ICU delirium. And then for ketamine, it's going to be emergence reactions like hallucinations and a transient increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Other things to look out for in propofol. So one thing that we do is we check a triglyceride level usually every three days or so because we want to look out for a very dangerous condition and that's going to be called propofol infusion syndrome. This is characterized by acidosis. Rhabdo, and most importantly, uh, the side effect of bradycardia, which can be fatal. So usually if triglycerides are getting up to like 400 or 500 range, that's when we're going to switch off of propofol onto another agent. Uh, also, if they're having bad hypotension, that's another reason that we might want to switch to Presidex or something like that. And finally, another side effect to know about is that Propofol can cause green urine, and this is not a sign of, you know, impending propofol infusion syndrome. It's just a side effect that we sometimes see. Presidex I really like because some of its advantages are that it's actually pretty good in patients who are kind of agitated, and it's really good for patients with ICU delirium. The other thing is that it causes less respiratory depression compared to the other agents, and so we can even extubate people while they're on Presidex, and even when they're off the ventilator and they're just breathing on their own, you can still have them on Presidex because there's less respiratory depression. The one thing I would say is that it's a little bit weaker than propofol in terms of getting you to that adequate sedation goal. Midazolam is a medication that I really like to try to avoid if possible because it's associated with ICU delirium. Uh, patients also build tolerance to it over the next 48 to 72 hours, so they're going to need increasing doses of midazolam. It also uh, builds up in your fat stores, and so basically, once you take the midazolam off, it's going to take a long time for all of that to come out of their body. So sometimes you turn off the midazolam, and you know if they were on it for a week, it's going to take like five or six days for it to come out sometimes. And whereas Propofol, you turn it off and 10 minutes, the patient's going to be starting to wake up. One good thing about midazolam is that it has a neutral effect on blood pressure. So that can be helpful. And finally, moving on to ketamine, uh, you know, it's an agent that's gaining popularity because it has both sedation effects, uh, but also has good analgesia properties as well. And there's no loss of consciousness with this. So it's also another agent you can use as you're trying to wean somebody from the ventilator. Uh, but I definitely think still at this current point in time, we're definitely relying mostly on propofol and Presidex and then moving on to midazolam and ketamine and agents like that later down the line. And then real quick on typical doses that you're gonna see while you're in the hospital. So propofol is gonna be five to 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute. You will sometimes see up to 100, so that's definitely a possibility. Presidex is gonna be 0.2 to 1.4 micrograms per kilogram per hour. Midazolam is gonna be anywhere from two to 20 milligrams per hour. Um, and then once you're getting past like 10, that's like a lot of midazolam. It's going to take a long time for that to come out of their system. And then ketamine is usually 8 to 25 milligrams an hour drip. And then just really quickly, I wanted to talk about how we titrate sedation. So the thing we use is called the RAS scale or the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale. And you can see that it ranges from negative 5 to plus 4. And so the more positive you are, it's the more agitated and combative you are. 0 to negative 2 is going to be really our kind of goal is you're kind of calm, you're a little bit drowsy, sedated. And then uh, the further negative you go, the less responsive you become. So this is a very common thing that the nurses are going to ask you because you need to tell them what you want to titrate the sedation to. And so usually a good goal is going to be zero to negative one. If somebody's on paralytics, they usually need a little bit higher sedation because you want to make sure they're definitely 
uh, completely out of it while, before you paralyze them. And so sometimes we use a higher goal of like negative three to negative four uh, for paralyzed patients. Okay, so this is the RAS scale that you should definitely know about. All right, now let's move on to analgesia. So the agents that you should know here is gonna be fentanyl, dilaudid, and morphine. So it's really easy for me to categorize this as well because with uh, fentanyl, again, this is really gonna be my first line. And then, you know, if I need to, then I'll go down to dilaudid. And the way that I like to characterize this is fentanyl is is usually our first line because it has a neutral effect on blood pressure, whereas dilaudid and morphine can both cause a little bit more hypotension. Fentanyl, you're gonna see rates anywhere from 25 to 200 micrograms per hour. And then the times that I'm gonna use dilaudid instead of fentanyl is really if you're gonna have really opioid resistant or opioid tolerant patients, because sometimes the fentanyl is not gonna be enough and they're gonna need something stronger like dilaudid. And for morphine, it's really easy. It's got some anxiolytic properties. It has a um, good effect on decreasing air hunger. So this is really gonna be used in patients who are kind of going to that comfort care uh, or end of life stage of their treatment. Another thing to note is that morphine is renally cleared. So you have to be careful if somebody has an AKI and then dilaudid is hepatically cleared. So, you know, if somebody has a really bad AKI, you're probably gonna favor dilaudid more than morphine and vice versa. With analgesia, make sure you uh, put your patients on a really good bowel regimen because opioid induced constipation is gonna be very, very common in these ICU patients. And then if you need to, you sometimes will need to use a medication called methyl naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist that works strictly in the GI tract. It's super, super expensive, but sometimes if somebody's been on a lot of dilaudid and they haven't pooped in like five days, you may need to resort to using methyl naltrexone. That's it for sedation and analgesia. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please subscribe and follow up for the next video, which is part three, where we're gonna talk about paralytics in the ICU.